One other new thing, um, we are broadcasting this um, on Facebook Live as we speak. So you all are on Facebook Live, um, and um, we are going to take some questions on Facebook Live too via social media. So that's something new that we're trying, so we have some live things going on. Um, if you have questions of our panelists, there are these little note cards that are on your chairs. Um, just write them, and some ASCE staff will come pick them up, and then we'll do that during the Q&A that will end the session. This will be in addition to the questions and answers that our moderator is going to do. And again, it's, it's kind of thrilling for me to talk a little bit about our, our, this year's panel and council. Um, we are doing something, we call it From Disasters to Solutions. Um, I don't know about you all, but certainly in my own company, we're being asked by our clients to design projects and facilities that are resilient and sustainable um, and to account for future climate change. So we wanted to have a panel um, talk to you about that. Um, and when we talk about that, I, I'm, ASCE is here to help. And I wanted to talk about what we could do um, and how we are helping. And so if you would have saw Tom Smith's presentation this morning, you can see that our new strategic plan, goal three, says that all infrastructure is going to be safe, resilient, and sustainable. Um, and again, our panel is going to talk a little bit about that with lessons learned. Um, we also have ASE's Grand Challenge, which for those of you who don't know what the Grand Challenge is, it's to reduce the life cycle costs of infrastructure projects by 50%. Um, and in doing so, we hope that projects would use life cycle cost analysis, that they'd use performance-based design, that they would be resilient, um, and there would be some innovation associated with that. So speaking of innovation, my second commercial is there's a cards like this on your chair. Our fourth innovation contest is open. We would love for you to submit on this. Um, we have done three of them and gotten some really bold solutions that are being proposed. It's easy, it's online, and anybody that has an innovative thought, it's basically doing a five-page paper talking about it. So please do the innovation contest. Um, and so now I want to talk a little bit about our panels of experts. Um, we have experts here on public policy associated with climate change and resiliency. We have experts who have participated on ASCE committees. We have experts that are major infrastructure owners who have experienced some major climate change issues associated with their facilities, and you're about to hear all that. And so to lead us in our discussion today, um, our moderator is going to be none other than Chris Stone on my immediate right. Chris is the CEO of Clark Nexon, one of Virginia's oldest and largest full-service architecture, engineering, and interior design firms, headquartered in Virginia Beach. He has over 40 years' experience. You can see he's very mature. He's a fellow of the American <laughs> Society of Civil Engineers. He served as national president for the uh, National Society of Professional Engineers from 2011 and 12, and he also serves on the ASCE Industry Leaders Council. So please join me in welcoming Chris Stone and Chris's moderation of the panel. Chris. All right. Thanks, Terry. Um, with friends like that, I'm not sure who needs enemies, but anyway. Um, as Terry said, this is being broadcast on Facebook Live, so um, my only warning is if you are here with someone that you don't want to be seen with, now is your opportunity to separate yourself. Um, so it's a very relevant topic uh, for us. Um, I live in Hampton Roads, and Hampton Roads really is, is kind of ground zero for a lot of the topics that we're going to be talking about, um, such as uh, sea level rise, climate change, uh, and resiliency. And in fact, in the last you know, month, we've been uh, just on the outskirts of two hurricanes, Hurricane Florence and Hurricane Michael. And uh, we, we really uh, did sustain a fair amount of damage um, from both of those hurricanes, even though they weren't direct uh, hits on the Hampton Roads area. And Hampton Roads is a very interesting location. Um, it's, uh, it's made up of about 1.8 million people. Um, Virginia Beach, where I am from, is the largest city in Virginia. Um, it covers about 4,000 square miles, and it's made up of, of 10 cities. And one of the interesting things about that is that the cities are, are fairly contiguous. And so you really don't distinguish between one city and the next. And so some of what we're going to talk about here today is you know, how uh, cities can collaborate with one another and how they can all deal with uh, the, some of the same issues. 
So Virginia Beach is trying to be uh, proactive when it comes to a lot of this. Um, we've just ended a year-long study where we have looked at rainfall and the impact that it's going to have on our city, and we're actually predicting and we have put into place uh, some new code standards which mandate a 20% increase in rainfall. Now, if you think about that, for those of you that design stormwater, um, that can be significant. But the 20% was only based on a 40-year life cycle. And when you think of infrastructure having a 100-year life cycle, if you extrapolate that out, that 5% per decade, you could be looking at a design level of 50% of your current day rainfall amounts um, for your stormwater infrastructure, which is pretty significant. Um, the other thing that we're faced with is sea level rise. Uh, sea level rise in Hampton Roads, we've already experienced about a foot of sea level rise in the last decade. Um, we're expecting about another foot and a half within the next 35 to 40 years, and by 2085, they're saying it could be upwards of three feet of sea level rise. Now, in Virginia Beach, um, the average elevation goes from zero to about 150 feet is not a lot of difference uh, in elevation because the 150 feet is actually the top of the landfill in the city of Virginia Beach. Um, the other thing that we're really faced with is land subsidence. Um, so the combination of sea level rise and land subsidence uh, is something that's hard to predict and I think we as engineers um, need to educate not only the public but educate our, our government officials as well in terms of what all of this means. Um, for, the, uh, for the design world and public safety. Because we do have that fiduciary responsibility to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public. Um, I will also add, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit today, about the ethical challenges that we have as engineers when we know that the code may be substandard in terms of what we need to design for future climate change. So we have a great panel. Um, we're gonna uh, start down here, and I'm gonna introduce everybody, and then they'll have an opportunity um, to, to talk a little bit about uh, their particular uh, focus area. Um, but at the end, we have Alice Hill, um, Alice is a research fellow um, with the Hoover Institute whose work has included policy issues related to resiliency and the impacts of climate change. Uh, Alice has worked in the White House uh, and helped develop climate change policy, and she has also participated in the third national climate assessment. Uh, next to her is Bilal Ayoub. Uh, he is a professor and director uh, at the University of Maryland. Uh, he recently was the editor uh, for the publication, the ASCE publication, and it's the MOP 140, which was Climate, Resilient Infrastructure, Adaptive Design, Risk Management. Uh, next to him is Kathleen White. Kathleen is with the uh, Corps of Engineers, and she led the Climate Preparedness and Resilience Community of Practice, and she also led the Civil Works Guidance Program for the Corps. And next to her is Jim Storacci, and Jim is the Chief Engineer for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. So with that, we'll start with Alice. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and your story of uh, Hampton Roads and Virginia Beach reminded me of really where this issue was brought home to me. Uh, I had just joined the White House, and my second day there, I was invited to a meeting with a senior official from Norfolk. Uh, and he said, essentially, we need help. He said, uh, we just completed our uh, light rail system called the Tide, uh, and we have some 30 military installations in the area. About 90% of the personnel that work on those military installations work off base, and they need ways to get to work. We have sunny day flooding, and we have a land subsidence. And he said, you know, when we built that tide, the, the line, we didn't consider sea level rise. So now that light rail system is at risk for flooding. Uh, and it also possibly could have been a barrier, uh, flood barrier. And that was my introduction to how hard this is on the ground to build resilience. When I was at the White House, I had the great fortune of working with Dick Wright, I think is in the audience, uh, Bilal and Kate White, who assisted um, a team in trying to determine how do we build infrastructure that's resilient to the most certain things that occur with climate change, which would be flooding from sea level rise. Uh, there's really no question that the seas have rised 
uh, at least eight inches uh, since record keeping began and are accelerating. Much of that has occurred since 1993. So we are accelerating in our sea level rise and what do we do? It seems to me that civil engineers, you in this room are in, uni in a unique position to help the city managers of Norfolk and every other city in the United States and around the world make the right decisions as to what kind of investments they need to make in infrastructure to have it be resilient. Uh, you'll hear about your ethics. Uh, certainly, uh, there's probably an ethical obligation. In my prior life, I was a judge. I think there's also probably some legal risk here uh, because the building standards, for the most part, have not kept up with the risks and the threats that we're seeing. And if we continue to build according to building standards, I'm sure there's a clever lawyer or set of lawyers or army of lawyers that will want to find someone to pay when the infrastructure fails in the face of a risk that could have been reasonably anticipated. And then I would just say that because you're in a unique position as we confront this issue, this threat, to us, uh, you're, you can help others understand why we need to make the choice to build that bridge or hospital or whatever choice we're making to invest deeply in a structure to build it resiliently and get as many benefits from, as we can from that structure to protect us going forward. Okay, thanks, Alice. Um... Alice did mention there was a light rail system that city of Norfolk had just completed. The light rail system was going to be extended into the city of Virginia Beach. And what's interesting about this topic is it's not only uh, in terms of recurrent flooding, it impacts all of the infrastructure I think that we deal with. And this particular light rail extension was actually gonna be paid for completely by the state. However, the opponents um, got to the, uh, the legislature and the phrase that they used was drains, not trains. And it was extremely effective uh, in terms of getting a really important uh, public infrastructure project killed um, because of this issue. And so, Bilal. Um, th thank you, Chris, for framing the problem and Alice for articulating the challenges that we have or some aspects of them. What I'd like to do with a few slides is to offer uh, a, a direction or a track for uh, helping the engineering community in uh, meeting that challenge. Do I have the slides up? You should move forward. It's, it's up here. It's not on this one. It's not on here. Oh. All right. Let me go back. Oh, it's not on it's the screen it. here. Oh, no. okay. All right. Sorry. All right. Uh, what, I'd like, what I'm going to do is introduce uh, a manual of practice. It's an ASC document that was recently released, and the title of it is Climate Resilient Infrastructure. And the outline of my presentation is starting with needs and objective, and then we are, I'm going to describe the scope and provide an outline of this manual of practice and describe to you a new design philosophy uh, and the overall methodology uh, which is centered around adaptive design and risk management. Uh, the needs, I could say, it stems primarily from two directions. One is uh, design requirements for new projects by owners, where there is a call explicitly for uh, providing a design with adaptation to a changing climate. Uh, so that's one, one, uh, one need. The second one is uh, a sense of urgency which came to me as well as to a group of ASC members. Uh, and the urgency in here is based on the fact that according to the U US Census Bureau, the value of construction put in place is about $1.3 trillion a year. And that's based on 2018 uh, figures. So here we have the country, we are putting $1.3 trillion a year of bridges, buildings, and so on. And I can tell you most of it, if not all of it, not designed uh, with a climate change in mind. That is a long-term investment. It does take the life, you know, the lives of those 
uh, different assets, it could be anywhere from 50 to 100 years or even more. So it's going to be with us for many years to come. And the question is, is it really wise to do it this way? So we had a sense of urgency that we needed to provide the engineering community some guidance of how to deal with this uh, in order to address both items. Uh, so the document provides guidance to engineers. It's not a standard. It's the closest that we can get to a standard. Uh, but the, the process of creating a manual, a manual of practice is streamlined compared to a standard. A standard does take time, and, and hence we decided to go this way to start with. Uh, the document has been released, as I mentioned earlier. It's available outside the DSC library booth. And, and that's the cover of the document. Uh, I'd like, I have to recognize uh, the group of authors and ASC members who took the lead on putting this together. And this is all volunteer work. Uh, and we had a blue ribbon review panel as required by ASC uh, rules in order to approve such a document. Uh, I'm not planning to go through the details of the content. I just want to show you the richness of what's in that manual of practice. It starts with an introduction that defines uh, basically the context, uh, the users, the scope, and so on. Chapter two deals with the science, climate science, uh, and it covers the hazards, the hazards that are of interest to engineers. Uh, then we cover what's called the observational method. It's a classical method which was used uh, in the geotech field, and it offers as an introduction to the concept of adaptive design. Uh, then it will be followed by one of the hazards, uh, which is uh, precipitation and flooding. And in there, we cover extremes, and we talk about flood design and flood loads. We know that the hazards associated with a changing climate, they do go beyond uh, precipitation and extreme. Uh, so we, d we decided to start with this item, but more could be done in the future. Uh, then chapter seven, which is the primary uh, framework that we offer in here, is adaptive design and risk management. Then we thought that users would be looking for data sources, and we have chapter eight, followed by appendices, and in particular, the very la the last appendix on adaptation technologies. Uh, and basically, uh, uh, the reason behind that appendix is to deal with existing infrastructure. Um, the dilemma for engineers is that uh, the past does not represent the future. Historically, design standards and building codes are based on historic information. We know now with a changing climate that we cannot do it that way, and hence we have to move from what we call uh, reliability-based design, which is the basis of robust design, to what we call adaptive design. And what changed is really the uncertainty. The uncertainty it used to be of the type what we call randomness and vari variability, but now we have projections. We are projecting where the sea level will be in the future based on energy consumption, based on population growth, emission of uh, greenhouse gases, and so on. Those projections, there are so many assumptions, and hence the bigger uncertainty. And as a result, we need to have this concept or this design philosophy of adaptive design. Um, the framework, I could describe it at a high level as being, uh, it's not prescriptive, it's not like a standard, it's quantitative, probabilistic in nature, analytic, we try to stick to native units so that we could do economic valuation, so that it will help informing decisions and policies. Uh, it is a step towards development of standards, and that's something we are talking about nowadays. I don't expect you to be able to read the details of the slide. I just want you to, uh, to get you eager to go and pick up a copy from the, <laughs> <laughs> from the stations out there in order to read the details. Uh, let me give you an example. <clears throat> uh, we, we, earlier, Chris and Alice, they talked about sea level rise. I'd like you to uh, uh, first uh, maybe understand the nature of the figure. The x-axis is time in years. The vertical axis is the sea level projected in the year 2100. So the vertical axis is the sea level in 2100. I'd like you to uh, note the numbers. There are four numbers, one to four. Let's assume that we are in year 2015, 
and I'm projecting the sea level for the year 2100. So my projection is a little bit broad, uh, wide. There are bounds of uncertainty in there. Uh, and if I design based on the current standards, this will get you to, step to number, number, number two. So if I design on the standards now, it will be deficient from day one almost, right? So I'm going to design to a higher level, which is number three in the figure. Uh, and with time, I'll monitor the project every maybe 10 years or 15 years or some. And then if we find that our projections of the 2100 year uh, sea level is not in line of what we did, what we projected in 2015, then we will, we will be able to uh, adapt the project by uh, adding to the design. The design will be done in a manner to have features in it to enable uh, increasing whether it's the protection height or any other project features of interest. And what you, that's what you see in terms of the step function is increasing the level of protection. Now we have a case, an actual case, uh, which uh, use adaptive design and that's what we have in this example is the Los Angeles to San Diego rail corridor and basically we have, as you can see in the image, uh, a, a series of bridges there, and those bridges were designed with piers that will enable inserting uh, segments in order to raise the height of the bridge. And that's an example of how you know, adaptive design could be done. In this case, the foundation system has to be built oversized to account for future changes, and that, and that option, creating that option in that project, we call it a real option. And actually, a real option added to a project will, will enhance the economic value of that project. So if somebody is doing economic valuation, the value of such a project will become higher as a result. Uh, that's the last slide I have, and thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Bilal. And um, Bilal has agreed to autograph the first 100 copies that are sold. Yes. Um, so make I sure you one. get out there. I did too. Make sure you get out there and get one. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Kathleen White, and she's going to tell us what the core is doing uh, in response to this. Okay, so while the slides are coming up, I will say that I did get a copy autographed by Bilal, and I'm very pleased to have it. Um, I know you. that the Corps of Engineers is, were uh, assisted in this, and uh, it's a very nice, broad uh, description of the kind of work that we've been doing for several years. So I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about water resources, which is our Corps of Engineers Civil Works. And what I'm showing you here is from basically the mountains to the coast, the world of water resources that I'm dealing with in the core, and that is the navigation mission, the flood risk reduction mission, aquatic ecosystem restoration, recreation, hydropower, permitting, which probably many of you are familiar with, um, and all the other missions that we have, it forms a system, uh, and so that each part of the system is somewhat reliant on the other. For example, if we're doing dredging for a navigation channel, we often use the dredge material for aquatic ecosystem restoration, or we use it for a beach fill to provide coastal storm risk management. So in a way, the system itself has a little bit of flexibility and adaptability to disruptions, and there's a little bit of movement in there. We'd like to increase that more along the lines of what um, Bilal has described in this new manual of practice. So when we think about um, solutions, technical solutions, often people think of engineering first as the technical solution. And that, for us, has become an evolving concept in the Corps of Engineers where we have to take these future conditions into account. We realized that our previous um, way of doing this back in the, in the 40s and the 50s of using freeboard, for example, for a river project, using that freeboard to account for an uncertain future, kind of evolved into using risk and uncertainty where we might have been a little bit overconfident in our knowledge about the uncertainties. And we may have reduced uncertainties that we knew about but maybe to the point where uncertainties that we didn't know about are not accounted for. So we have to be careful with that engineering that we're looking at the entire system. And then we have to consider that economic lifetime. Bilal raised that point, and I, and I think that Alice raised it as well, is that the economics of a project means that over the lifetime of the project, you'll get a return on investment that's more than what you put into it. So we have been working very closely with economists in the Corps of Engineers for over 50 years to try to make sure that the water resources infrastructure we put in place is worthwhile for the taxpayer. Now environmental um, 
environmental aspects really came up in the 60s and the 70s with Rachel Carson, with the formation of the environmental protection agencies. But it turns out to be a very important part of any kind of a water project because water is the lifeblood for environmental um, goods and services that provide a lot of uh, input to the economy, whether it's on a regional or national basis. So we're really paying attention to that because environmental um, conditions and ecosystems are often the first that are impacted by climate change. And then last, I want to mention that as we've evolved, we've realized that it's really the social aspects that are really coming to the forefront now in decision making. And, uh, and Alice pointed this out, and you'll, we talked about it previously ourselves, but you know, when we do a federal project, a water infrastructure project, the customer is the people. All of the people. As civil engineers, we don't discriminate on which kind of people we're doing this project for. It's for the taxpayers of the United States. So that social um, vulnerability and social resilience and adaptive capacity are ever more important as we consider our future designs. So, oops, not too fast. All right, so for the Corps of Engineers, we've put into place four principles for resilience. We have prepare, absorb, recover, and adapt. And if I could add a little bit to this, for prepare, it's something like anticipate what's coming, pre-plan what's happening, and stockpile. If you think about what's happened with Hurricane Michael, that stockpiling would have been really important, all right? Um, absorbing, resisting, withstanding, failing safely. For the core, failing safely is an important is important part of what we do, especially since Hurricane Katrina and the failures that occurred there. And then when we think about recovery, our, our instinctive reaction is to rebuild. But what we'd like to do, not just recover quickly, but recover wisely. And Bial mentioned this as well. It's the wise adaptation. It's conservation of resources, our financial resources, and our personal and social and economic resources all together. And then finally, thinking about adaptation as a transformation. It's not always about doing the same thing, maybe higher or stronger or better. Sometimes it's doing something different. And it's laying out what those potential options are and making the decision ahead of time which then, as we go through the cycle, means that you, you don't have to anticipate as much, maybe not absorb as much, maybe you are recovering more wisely. So finally, with our water systems, if you look at the gray background here, that's the water system with everything working perfectly, that's the pipes all working, all the different components, some of them having multi-purposes, some of them having single purposes. But what we actually have is the one in front. We've got a bunch of leaky pipes out here in this country, and those leaky pipes represent challenges but also opportunities. Each opportunity gives us a chance to innovate, and I, that's why I encourage you to do the innovation challenges. It gives us a chance to innovate and maybe transform to be more resilient to the future changes. And the change, challenge that we're facing in water is that we have too much water sometimes, too little water, sometimes it's too dirty, it impacts our economics and our transportation and our energy production and our ecosystems. And now with climate, changing climate, it's too erratic, and we need to be able to deal with that erratic water, and that's what we're trying to do all together, this panel. So I'll end there. Okay, great. Thanks, Kathleen. I think the big takeaway is uh, adaptability and flexibility because no one solution is going to be the same for maybe another, um, you know, another location. So that's something we certainly need to keep in mind. So next we're going to hear from, uh, from Jim. And Jim, Chief Engineer, Port Authority. What's the uh, Port Authority doing in New York and New Jersey? So if, you, if you're not familiar with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, it's a bi-state agency created in 1921 to build and to operate transportation facilities between the two states. And we have 21 facilities, five airports, including the three big ones in New York, JFK, Newark, and LaGuardia, two Hudson River tunnels, four bridges, two bus terminals, five marine terminals, the PATH rail system, which is 13 stations connecting Manhattan, Hoboken and Jersey City, and the 16-acre World Trade Center site. And we got $3.2 billion annual operating budget and a $32 billion 10-year capital plan, which includes 600 projects, including redevelopment of our airports, a new LaGuardia air train system, new Gothels Bridge, rebuilding the Bayonne and the George Washington Bridge, the beginning of a new Midtown bus station, and $1 billion a year in capital spending on state of good repair projects. So many Port Authority facilities are susceptible 
to, add, to be impacted by storms and future climate change. And the challenge we've had is so many existing facilities can't be raised. They have to be dealt with in their current place. So during Superstorm Sandy in 2012, the three major airports, the Holland Tunnel, the PATH system, and the World Trade Center were severely impacted. And we learned from the storm. And since 2012, the Port Authority has been planning and rebuilding and investing in fixing and strengthening for the future. We're going to end up spending about, with our partners at FEMA, about $3 billion in rebuilding what was damaged in 2012. And to make our facilities more resilient for the future, we've prepared a guideline for design of new facilities, which take into consideration uh, the asset life and future climate change impacts and, and sea level rise. So since this is Superstorm Sandy, we've rebuilt and we're hardening for the future, as I said. In PATH, we're rehabilitating completely the tunnels between Jersey City and, and New York. The station entrances and maintenance facilities will be hardened and protected based on the vulnerabilities we learned from what happened in Sandy. Holland Tunnel flooded. We are rebuilding all the infrastructure in the Holland Tunnel starting in 2020. Airfield lighting systems were damaged. Terminal, the terminals and the infrastructure feeding the terminals uh, were damaged and they will be rebuilt and flood protected. And again, flood protection at our ports and the World Trade Center site was not complete in 2012. So it flooded and in, in turn flooded the path system which comes into the World Trade Center. So that is being, World Trade Center is obviously complete and it's been hardened with a protection system around the building and inside the building. So Sandy was a wake-up call for the Port Authority and for many agencies in New York and New Jersey that were impacted. And it generated a whole bunch of new initiatives, created new roles and responsibilities, and created an immediate urgency to plan for short-term and long-term. And we, again, as I said earlier, we learned our most vulnerable assets. So we needed immediately to protect the vulnerable assets for 2013. We simply didn't know what was going to happen in 2013. So we quickly put together, we went to industry, we saw what was available, we did some down and dirty things, stop logs, barriers, anything we could do quickly, generators to protect what was damaged, protect our most vulnerable assets. And then began to plan for the future and we prepared a guideline which we completed the first version in 2015 and released an update uh, this year. And the purpose of the guideline was to put some science, some, some, an approach based on managing climate related risks including sea level rise, increased storm surge, heat and precipitation. And the guidelines factor, as I said earlier, the life of an asset, the projected sea level rise which we got from the uh, the baseline from the New York City study that was done in 2015. So we collaborate with our sister agencies in New York and as, as many agencies as mine, we depend on industry. We depend on engineers like yourself to help us with new ideas, to help us build stronger, build for the future, and to keep with budgets and schedules along with that and to have the creativity to help us strengthen existing facilities that cannot be raised. The Holland Tunnel, I can't raise the Holland Tunnel, so we've figured <laughs> out a way to block the entrance with a flexible gate that can be put into place when a storm is coming. And act the industry for hardening uh, facil existing facilities for future resilience is evolving. And we created a library of products that we vetted, that our designers, I have a department of 550 engineers and consultant staff of at least double that to help us deliver our capital plan, a library of resources to use to, have, to, to implement resiliency ideas at our existing facilities. So New York and New Jersey is better than it was. We've learned a lot, we've grown, but there's a lot more work to do. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jim. So we have some questions for our panel. And uh, Alice mentioned that she has a legal background, so we wanted to talk about risk management, um, especially when it comes to climate risks, knowing that we can't necessarily absolutely quantify 
sea level rise and land subsidence, and so how do we deal with that? So the question for uh, Alice is, how prevalent is the concern about negligence liability for failure to consider climate risks? I think there's a growing concern. Uh, the way this typically works is you'll start having legal journals uh, describe what the problem could be and some possible solutions. And we've seen that. We've seen uh, some lawyers who work in the field of risk management identify the professional liability of designing buildings or running corporations and not taking into consideration climate risk, future risk, uh, should those, uh, there be damage as a result of those decisions. I had thought that this was more esoteric uh, until recently. I was uh, called by a lawyer somewhat in a panic uh, and he told me uh, that he was addressing a group of 50 general counsel uh, who were engaged in some aspect of the construction industry on this issue of liability for failure to consider uh, climate risk in design. And that told me that uh, they are spotting the issue. In the press, there's a lot of talk about climate litigation. It's mostly about whether uh, the fossil fuel companies will be held liable for emissions. I think most legal scholars think those, it's gonna be very difficult for those cases to succeed. And they view this professional liability set of cases as where uh, you'll see more litigation. We are already seeing litigation over adaptation choices either the failure to make a choice to adapt or making a choice that was maladaptation, maybe for your neighbor, you decided to do something that hurt your neighbor. We also see it occurring uh, in uh, cities. Uh, we have cities who've said for aesthetic reasons they don't wanna raise the homes. This happened in Sandy uh, in Connecticut. Uh, and uh, the homeowner took the case to court and the court said, uh, we can't leave reason behind. We're gonna elevate in the face of climate change and we're gonna allow homeowners to do that. Uh, so we'll see this unfold slowly in the courts. Uh, I think there are definitely things that uh, civil engineers can do to protect themselves, but in the role of educating clients um, uh, and uh, those that are seeking your professional advice, to advise them on uh, the future risks and the choices that they could take to mitigate those risks would go a long way in protecting you against professional liability. Okay, thanks, Alice. Um, a couple of points there. I know Alice and I talked about this earlier before. For engineers, I think it's very important to recognize that what you do in one locality has an impact on adjacent localities. Um, and it's extremely important to take all of those into account, not just be myopic in terms of your particular project. And the, the phrase that we used was, you know, for cities that are contiguous with one another, you know, one city's wall can become another city's dam, um, which is something that I think we all have to be uh, cognizant of. And so next question is for Bilal. And uh, Bilal, you uh, were the recent editor for the Manual of Practice. Don't forget those 100 signed copies. <laughs> um, so what is the difference between a manual, a practice, and a standard? Um, well, let me start with a, a journal, a journal paper. I mean, I've written a good number of journal papers, and those represent the opinion of an individual. Or it could be a group of authors. Of course, it has to be vetted, reviewed, and all of this, and accepted to an archival journal. Uh, so this is one step towards creating what I call a body of technical bases in order to prepare other documents. A manual of practice is basically a set of facts and procedures uh, that are presented uh, for the use of practicing engineers, and they are structured in a rational fashion, uh, and they have to pass through uh, basically two levels of acceptance, I could say. One is acceptance by the, a bigger group of authors. It's not like a journal. So now you have a group, in our case, we had about 10 people, and it went through a blue ribbon review as well as review of, by selected organizations. Uh, and this will offer, I could say, the 
the, the, the highest level of vetting before you put it into a standard. Right? It could offer the technical basis for preparing a standard. Uh, now, what is a standard? A standard is, uh, is prepared through meeting a set of requirements, uh, basically that describe a process. The process has to be open for participation by all the stakeholders. It has to be balanced, and it needs to be through consensus among other requirements. Those requirements are specified by the American National Standards Institute, and the Inst ANSI for short uh, will certify organizations, not standards. They will certify an organization that they have the process to actually produce a standard. ASC is certified to produce a standard. Okay, great, thanks. So our next question is for uh, Kathleen. Uh, does the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers consider sustainability and resilience in its plans and designs? Okay, so I talked a little bit about our resilience initiative and our resilience principles. Um, these were instituted around 2015 and 2016. Um, in terms of sustainability for our, our buildings and facilities, we've had that for quite a while, but for what we call our horizontal infrastructure, our levees, our river channels, our locks and things like that, we are now working on a set of sustainability metrics to be able to assess those. And one kind of difference between these federal investments is it's not just the environmental and, and the social and the economic, it's also are we meeting the intended purpose of this investment by the taxpayer? So it's that um, life cycle performance and reliability over time. Um, for, in terms of climate preparedness and resilience, we've had, our, actually our first sea level guidance was in 1986, updated in 1989, 2000, 2009. Um, our regulation on sea levels came out in 2013. Um, our manual on how to adapt to sea level came out in 2014. So we've got projects now through the planning process, through the congressional uh, authorization process and now getting into the appropriation process to get the money to actually build them that, that include those, um, th those uh, resilient standards. And for our hydrologic uh, impacts of climate change, we've had qualitative approaches um, since about 2014, um, and we're hoping to get out quantitative guidance later this year. So we're making a progression kind of in the way that Bilal described it, starting broad and kind of narrowing in over time um, and trying to take it as uh, deliberately as possible so that we can come up with reproducible results with, with whatever we do. Okay, great. Uh, Jim, I know you talked a little bit about this. Um, New York and New Jersey were severely impacted by Superstorm Sandy in 2012. Um, I know you mentioned the inundation of the subway system. I know those of us that live in Hampton Roads, we had one of our tunnels that actually flooded. Um, if you've never seen a tunnel full of water, it's a very impressive sight. Um, it's also very difficult to clean up. Um, but how, how have the uh, lessons learned from Sandy impacted both short-term and long-term resiliency planning and construction at the Port Authority? Well, as I said earlier, we, um we learned our vulnerabilities, and they were very simple places, stairways, elevators, um, substations, um, our airfields, electrical infrastructure, and the Holland Tunnel and the World Trade Center. Uh, we, we learned where we had to protect. And so the immediate steps, again, as I said earlier, for 13, to 2013 was to, was to protect those in, in the short term, to... To, uh, to make sure that, that we were, had immediate protection on our vulnerable locations. We created a chief, a position of chief of resiliency and sustainability in the Port Authority to, to just focus on that particular issue, sustainability and particularly resilience, and take us into the future and be, give us the expertise as an agency to, to help us grow in that area. Uh, and he, and he, he um, led the effort to uh, create our design guideline, which uh, any designer who works, any, any designer internal to the Port Authority or, a consul or consultants that work for us use that guideline on new construction. It also gives the flexibility to deal with, as I said earlier, existing facilities that, that you can't necessarily raise to, uh, to meet future climate change uh, and sea level rise uh, forecasts. Uh, and again, we, we've, we researched industry, and this is an evolving 
um, uh, industry where there are products out there to help fix problems of existing infrastructure. Simple things, gates, uh, louvers that are, that are buoyant, that as floodwaters rise, will close on louvers, and we have vent buildings that ventilate our, our path system and our Holland Tunnel, which are vulnerable to floodwaters. So uh, things like that. Um, flexible, as I said earlier, there's a flexible uh, gate that we're gonna use to, to protect the Holland Tunnel. Um, it, so the, the, that was a, a tremendous amount of research we did and, uh, and continue to do. And, and learning from other agencies. We, we deal with our sister agencies, the, particularly the uh, New York City subways, the MTA, who, uh, who, had, who had severe damage to their subway system, just like we did with our path system. Okay, great. We're gonna jump back to Alice. And um, I know, Alice, you talked a little bit about this before, but um, do you predict that there will be an increase in litigation over damages from climate change? I know you talked about the litigation um, primarily would not be against the fossil fuel companies, but I wonder if you could also comment on um, how insurance plays into this, specifically e and insurance, and also the standard of care that we operate under. Sure, uh, I think that uh, there'll be director and officer uh, liability in, uh, insurance available for uh, those that are uh, serving as on the board of directors. Uh, I think there's professional liability insurance. I th think that the insurance companies uh, will start uh, expecting more as well uh, when they write these policies because the liability is simply growing and the ultimate question is who's going to pay. Right now, uh, it seems to be, we, don't, we have insurance companies paying on an annualized basis, and we have reinsurers insuring them. But as these losses grow, uh, and then we put back what we put back just as it was before, so we've done that with Maria in the Puerto Rico. We put back the electrical grid because we didn't have plans for how to do it better. Essentially, we're putting it back as it was. Again, it will be vulnerable to more intense storms that are predicted with climate change, as well as any sea level rise issues. And then we have, uh, with Michael, we'll have the same pressure to build back more. So eventually, uh, as we saw with Andrew in uh, the 90s, the insurance companies will say, we don't want to insure. This is already anecdotally occurring uh, in California with wildfire insurance. They're not going to want to insure the buildings. Uh, and uh, they will pull back from the market, uh, and then there'll be uh, opportunity uh, for uh, designers uh, of buildings to make them more resilient so that they can get insurance on them. Uh, once the insurance companies pull out, the reinsurers uh, decide that they don't want to cover this risk anymore, uh, then we're left with really the federal government as the ultimate insurer, uh, which the Government Accountability Office, when we step back the, from this and look at it at a macro level, they've said that the U.S. Treasury, these bailouts that we're doing right now put our U.S. Treasury at risk. And you look at the projections for climate change, we're gonna have a lot more bail, uh, bailouts. You've just heard, we have a huge built environment. We're doing 1.3 trillion of new infrastructure. That infrastructure that's new isn't resilient, and certainly what we have from the past isn't resilient. So we know there'll be a lot more damage ahead, uh, and uh, there'll be a lot more pressure from insurers, uh, if they want to be able to insure to have more resilient buildings, uh, or they'll just withdraw from the market, uh, which is historically what we've seen, is they just choose not to insure. Uh, this is, we're all pieces of this puzzle, but it's something historically we have never seen at this rate, at this pace, with this amount of damage. Last year, 2017, $303 billion worth of damage, the highest level ever in the United States. That's because we're more prosperous, we have more people, many things. Also, 17 separate $1 billion damage events, and that counted all the wildfires as one event. 
We are seeing unprecedented losses, the highest level losses uh, of insured losses also in 2017. And we know we've had worse wildfires and also uh, we've had Michael. This is the lay of the land, and so how do we find solutions that protect us and mitigate against that risk? Certainly, uh, I think the insurance companies uh, are feeling uh, the pressure uh, from these events, and over time, the projections are quite uh, serious for the amount of damage we may have to cover. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's it, the macro view. It, it does certainly, and risk management is something that we're always concerned about as, as licensed professionals. Um, well, all I want to uh, take it back to the manual of practice and, uh, and ask you, how, how does it compare to the development of a standard, and do you see this becoming a standard one day? Because we're always looking for, for tools, you know, to how to deal with these uncertainties. Um, yes, the development of the manual of practice started uh, in, I believe in 2017, in May 2017. Uh, it was done, prepared by the Committee on Adaptation to a Changing Climate. It's an ASC committee. Uh, and we had, we convened our, one of our meetings uh, and I put forward a proposal uh, where I described it at the time in, in the form of a question to the committee. Uh, would you like to make history? And, and the response was favorable by everybody in the room. And we, we, then we outlined the document, and we put a target that we'll have a first draft reviewed in 12 months. And that, the reason behind this uh, s schedule, expedited schedule, is the sense of urgency that I described in my uh, presentation. Uh, and truly, we kept up with that timeline. Uh, we had it uh, reviewed by the Blue Ribbon Panel. We, we addressed all their comments in a documented fashion, and we put it to production and ASCE and their staff have done an outstanding job in pulling it together, copy editing, proofreading, the graphics, the licensing for all the images, and it's available today, released today. Now, would that become a basis for preparing a technical standard? I could say yes, it could become a basis among other documents for preparing a technical standard. Uh, it cannot be just simply adopted as a standard. There is still more work that has to be done in order to bring it closer to the use by practicing engineers. The manual, the way it is now, is a framework. There are examples. There are steps that are spelled out with details. There are references and citations and so on. Uh, but to bring it to a standard, we have to bring it closer to the practicing engineers. So the, uh, and the manual of practice has last uh, item in here, um, is not completely done. I mean, again, the hazards that we have to deal with due to a changing climate, certainly they will go beyond extreme precipitation and flooding. Uh, we have wildfire, we, there's uh, heat waves and drought and so on. So we, we've done, we tried to deal with the, the hazard that the, we thought is the most significant and the most urgent and immediate. Uh, but I could see revisions of that manual of practice in the future. Okay, great. Um, Kathleen, a question for you. Um, there are so many journal papers dealing with climate science. Um, why don't you use just the latest information? <laughs> oh, gosh, I get that question all the time. You know, I saw this paper here. How come you're not using this projection of sea level? How come you're not using that precipitation? Uh, why aren't you using the NASA high, highly resolved uh, 2080 uh, precip, why aren't you using these IDF curves? So um, people are constantly asking that, and I think it goes back to the answer that Bilal just gave, and that is that um, there's science and then there's actionable science. So when he's talking about this process of moving from a manual practice into, into a standard, he's actually talking about that translational um, process of going from the science and the information to that manual practice and then again keep with pushback at every stage until it becomes a standard and for us we're doing the same thing all the time we're evaluating the new science information we have teams of scientists from around the world that we work with and we ask questions of, of and we uh, we bounce ideas off to make sure that when we look at the science we're actually getting kind of an opinion that will hold up over time for example, there was a really influential paper uh, in 2016 on a high-level sea, sea level rise projections. 
Uh, it's been discounted already by 2018. And now if we had left to move to that high level projection, we would have potentially made some uh, over investments today. So our job is to really sift through the information, aggregate it, and translate it into something usable for engineers. Okay, we're gonna do one more question and then we're gonna take questions from the audience. Um, but this one is for Jim. As an owner, uh, what sustainability and resiliency guidelines are required by the Port Authority? So as I had mentioned earlier, we, uh, we wrote our first guideline in 2015. We had talked about sustainability and resi resilience for a number of years before that, but again, uh, Sandy was a wake-up call. And our guidelines take the, the, uh, the FEMA flood elevations and add a contingency height onto new construction of freeboard. Uh, then we'll add a factor for future sea level rise, which again is based on the uh, New York City study in 2015. But the designer has a checklist. They have to see, first of all, what's the life of the asset that we're protecting? Uh, because uh, there, our money is not endless, and there's costs associated with this. So the idea is to put the proper resilience in, but I'm not going to put a hundred year res resilience into something that's only gonna last 30 years. So there's a checklist, How, what will be the life of the asset? And the sea level rise factor will be based on that. And there's also a, a, che a checkbox for criticality. How critical is the asset? Is it a substation? Is it, a, is it something that, that could create a life safety situation? Is it, th that will affect what additional height we put on the freeboard we'll put on to something that's new. So there's a range of height that we'll put on a new asset. We're building eight new substations over the next three or four or five years. All of these substations will have this sort of checklist that will go along with it based on those criteria. Future sea level rise, the criticality, the location of them. And we do that with all our new construction. Our guidelines also give some ideas to designers as to what to do when you have, an, again, an existing asset, which we have many of, that you can't raise, that you have to, um, but hey, you have to harden and make more resilient. Okay, great. So I know we're gonna take some questions from the audience, and Terry has some questions. So um, you can keep asking your questions. We have around, 25 minutes of, of Q&A here that we're taking. I have some already given to us, but you can still write questions and give them to staff, and we'll try to get them in. Um, I'd like to, you know, you think about it, you know, we were scared about Alice. We're all going to get sued if we don't do it. <laughs> Bilal's going to write a standard to make, make sure that we don't get sued, which will help yes. us great. Um, Kate will help guide us on what the Army Corps can do so that we know what standard of practices are. And Jim's agency has been very proactive in making sure that they've, they're publishing guidelines for us to follow as engineers. And again, we've, we, I think we had good closure on that. We know what to do on that. So, but my first question goes to Alice. And this is from the audience. So these questions that Chris asked, they were all, they knew about them. So they were really good to answer them. These are, are kind of new. Um, and so Alice, this was a question. Is the cause of climate change an obstacle um, to policy decisions? The, the, the debate about what the cause of climate change becoming an obstacle to policy decisions? Uh, I believe that uh, this issue has gotten politicized in a way uh, so that uh, even the term climate change, uh, many communities actively need to avoid it. In fact, uh, that's why I think the word resilience used to be climate adaptation. Now it's resilience because that's a very safe word. You don't have to refer to climate. So I do think uh, the debate over the cause uh, has, the political debate over the cause has influenced this. But I think there's something else at work here. It's that uh, the human brain uh, is not particularly well suited to deal with an existential risk of this nature. Uh, we are optimists. And this is a pretty pessimistic story. These are permanent changes we're talking about, at least for the foreseeable future, of sea level rise. Extreme heat. If you really look at the uh, reports that are coming out, 
peer-reviewed, 192 scientists across the uh, world come to agreement from 192 nations, and they reach a consensus statement, and it's very extreme heat levels. In some instances, it will not be habitable for, the, for humans, so there'll be massive migration. These are very difficult issues for uh, us, any of us, to handle. Uh, so we default, we are optimists. That's why, um, despite the divorce rate, people still go down the aisle and say, I do, and think they'll be married forever. We're optimists, and we have a recency bias. Next time you see a disaster, count how many times you hear, we've never seen this before. This is, we never expected it to be this bad. We've never seen or heard or ever even contemplated it. Well, that's what you get with climate change. What we had in the past is not a good guide for how intense these storms will be. Scientists are talking about a category six. We're seeing we have the sea level rise. Uh, it could be worse. We don't actually, uh, most of the projections that are presented and talked about publicly, and you question whether this is a good risk management approach, do not talk about the worst events. The worst events are so grim that pretty much we um, talk about two degrees, not a four degree world, that's four degrees Celsius. That's a very hot world, but if we continue on our current level of emissions, that's where we could end up. So I think it's the political has made it very difficult for people to talk about climate. So we find we use things like future risk and other terms, uh, but also I think it's the uh, behavioral economists would tell us this is about uh, decision making by humans and some of the factors that are involved with climate change make decision making particularly difficult in this area. Got it. Cool. So my next question is for you, Kate. Um, other than sea level rise, what is the biggest climate change threat to our infrastructure? And maybe we can qualify that to the core's infrastructure. Okay, so this would be for the Corps' civil works infrastructure, so not the Army installations, but just the, the water resources. And uh, um, I think that what we're actually seeing since about 2014 is uh, increased, um, increased uh, flash droughts, if you will. So we're seeing increased drying that leads to very quick onset of intense droughts. Uh, during which we have very heavy precipitation events. So for our operating our dams, that means that our flood control pools um, really need to be able to handle these intense rainfalls. If we look at the uh, 2015 and 2016 southwestern um, flood events that took place during a multi-year drought, what we saw with the Corps is we had 11 dams operating in the surcharge pool, which is above the top of dam but below the top of the gate. All right, so if you're a dam operator, you never want to be in the surcharge pool. And those dams actually started with water levels low because of the drought, so lower than we normally would have. So what we're seeing is this onset of drought and very heavy precipitation. So in the old days, people said the wet get wetter and the dry get drier. And what we're actually seeing is that everybody's getting wetter and drier. Uh, we have observed trends that show this increase in very heavy precipitation, particularly in the north central United States and the northeast. And this is really impacting our stormwater abilities. Mm -hmm. It's impacting our dam operations. And you've seen this increased flooding like this year. We had Maryland, we had Pennsylvania, we've had Iowa. If you look at the AHIPS map, you're just seeing those purple dots all over the place. So um, what we're seeing is this change in, uh, in dryness and wetness that we need to be keeping ahead of with our rural curves on our reservoirs and keep navigating through. Good. You know, we just had a recent instance occur in my home state of Maryland where they had to release floodgates from an electric power dam, the Conowingo Dam, yeah. and all of the trash and tree stumps that had built up behind it go over the floodgates, um, you know, because they're not going through the turbines generating energy, um, causing downstream damage to it, as far south as the port of Annapolis yeah. from Port Deposit. That's and you're, you're sitting there going, with it. nobody even thought of that um, during the time frame. But I have a question for you, Bilal, um, and this is, should we not be expediting the creation of standards given the UN's recent climate change report? Uh, 
Uh, I think there is a limit of how much we could expedite the development of a standard. Um, and the reason behind it is there is a process that has to be followed. And if you look at the ANSI requ requirements, um, basically it calls for uh, openness. It calls for, uh, it has a representation of all stakeholders or key stakeholders. And there has to be consensus. And reaching consensus might require several iterations of addressing comments received by stakeholders. So the process by nature is slow. Uh, it's almost like the federal government, right? And it's healthy to have it that way because you don't want to have quick changes, right? <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so basically, we are, it's in our mind, um, and we've been discussing it actually during the convention and by, with other, others of my colleague. It's, it's the next logical step is to examine how we could change the standards and where, which sections or which standards would be affected. We tried in the manual, we created an appendix, uh, I think it's appendix B, that lists all the ASC standards and it tags them by which one we think will be impacted. Um, so that's a process that we need to start. If we want to expedite it, uh, we, might not, we might not be able to uh, just simply rely on volunteer effort. Maybe there is a need for seeking funding so that we'll have people you know, fully devoted uh, to work on this task. Mm -hmm. Great, good. good. You know, I know that we are trying to develop a standard on sustainable infrastructure here at ASCE, and we, we, we set ourselves as a, an aggressive target that we could get this done in um, 18 months. Yeah. And the codes and standards people just laughed at us, and they go, 18 months, forget that. You're, you're talking years here, not months, that, in order for you to do this. So I can see that if we want to do it, we have to start really soon and now. If I may add uh, an, another aspect. I think we could make a distinction between preparing a new standard and revising existing standards. I mean, I could see some of the changes will be revisions to existing mm -hmm. standards. Now, existing standards, they have a revision cycle, which we have to stick with, right? I mean, it could be some of the standards, they might have a cycle of five years. Uh, in the interim, they could, it, it is possible to create documents or supplements, uh, so, but, but we need to make a distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. Good, good point, revisions. So Jim, I have a question for you. We, um, we've, we've been talking a lot about floods and hurricanes and wildfires, um, all of these things, um, and we haven't talked at all about cyber. And so the question comes to me, it says, it says cities are all racing to become smart. You know, what, what do the civil engineers need to do to interact properly with telecom data systems, energy companies, et cetera, et cetera, to ensure resilience? And again, I would relate that to a question of, hey, what's the Port Authority doing to protect its infrastructure as it relates to its cyber? Because the Holland Tunnel might not be flooded, but if the lights don't work, it's not going to matter. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what the Port Authority is doing with cyber resilience? Yeah, we, we've, um, we've worked with the um, local utilities. We've also brought in um, outside experts in the area to to, to evaluate our security for, for, for cyber, um, mm -hmm. and, and we've, we've, we've tried to increase our procedures and our protections to, to deal with that. Um, uh, you know, the, the other, the other th aspect of it is, is that historically we, we've, we've tried to get smarter. We've tried to uh, use technology to our benefit, and you know, in a public agency, Sometimes that's, that's slower than it is in, in the private world. So again, what we've done is we've brought in outside resources and worked with, again, the, the local utilities to try to incorporate the smartest technology that we possibly can to, to, do, to protect ourselves in that area. Okay. Um, here's a um, controversial question. Um, and it um, relates to the... Um, Many, many of our elected leaders in D.C. openly say that climate change is a hoax. Um, thus, we don't even call it climate change. We call it adaptive resilience. We call it something. And I'm assuming that whoever wrote this question was referring to many of our elected leaders, even at the top, um, they were referring to that. And so, like, how do we, uh, this would be a good question for you, Alice, because you're on the policy side. And, and Kate, if you could chime in on this, too. How do we, as responsible professionals, change the mentality 
uh, that, you know, hey, we're, we're chicken little, the sky is falling. We, we need you to acknowledge this. How do we do that? I think one avenue of uh, bipartisan agreement is uh, fiscal conservatism. Uh, in this issue. And when we're talking about risk mitigation, that's really what we're talking about is trying to prepare in advance to reduce the damages going forward. Remarkably, it has been Congress that has made the most progress on risk mitigation. They just passed a disaster preparedness bill that uh, I believe will take 6% of so we had uh, $303 billion, so 6% of that, I'll leave that to the engineers, uh, would be put into risk mitigation going forward within communities. Uh, and uh, so we've seen um, really movement that we haven't seen in uh, a Republican or a Democratic to try to push uh, to preparedness. As to the risk in all of this, though, is that if we continue not to, and, and I don't really care what term we use, it doesn't have to be climate change, but if we don't talk about the future risk from sea level rise, uh, more intense uh, wildfires that really damage the soil and increase the risk of uh, mudslides and, and into our drinking water, um, glacial melt that causes flooding, if we don't talk about those things, we can't be prepared for them. So uh, it is a difficult uh, way to go to uh, navigate, but the stakes couldn't be higher. I mean, we're talking about no one will be spared from climate change. It is affecting every corner of the world. The more affluent will certainly survive better but we're seeing it. If you just look at a map of the world and look at the extreme events that are occurring uh, in unprecedented ways, uh, we will leave ourselves highly vulnerable. So finding that fiscal conservative, we will better protect ourselves now. Uh, you've noticed no one has talked about the cause here. Uh, no one has talked about uh, uh, cutting emissions, and that's pretty common in this field. They just focus on what can we do to prepare. In answering that question, however, you must look at expected emissions, because if you don't look at expected emissions, it's impossible to determine what level of sea level rise you must consider. So then you get to the Bilal solution, you've got to have adaptability in there. Mm -hmm. It's a tough sell. Uh, but we have to do it. So let me throw that add on to what Alice said. Go ahead, Chris. Said. So uh, I think Alice is, is exactly right. I know in Virginia, um, the first thing that they did was they stood up a sea level rise commission. As soon as the commission formed, the first act of business was to change the name <laughs> to recurrent flooding because we couldn't call it sea level rise. And so I, I think we as engineers have a responsibility to try to educate the public and the politicians. And I think all too often, you know, we show up with a report and charts and no one other than maybe Bilal and a PhD could understand this. And so I think it scares people. And, and I think we have to use the best techniques we can in terms of visually kind of teaching people what this really means. Um, and I know you're right, we can't go to extremes and we sometimes do have a tendency to do that. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the recent um, interview that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson did but he talked about the impact of climate change and the visual that he used was if, uh, the, if we continue along this path and if uh, the, uh, the polar ice caps melt and, and the uh, ice sheets in Greenland, that it will create a sea level rise that will meet the elbow of the Statue of Liberty. Now that's something I think that you know, someone who's not an educated engineer can identify with. And I, and I think we need to start telling more of those kinds of stories to get the point across. So, Kate, I don't want to put you on the spot. Just because but, I'm a, a federal please. employee. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, what I want to say is that we've actually used a pretty simple set of words to describe our work in climate change over the past 10 years in the Corps of Engineers, and that is that as a federal agency investing taxpayer money, we have a responsibility to manage the risks of the observed 
and the reasonably foreseeable changes that are occurring. Mm -hmm. Now, we're putting together right now, in order to kind of communicate this to people, we're putting together an atlas of sea level change. And, if, if, and this is for tide gauges, NOAA tide gauges of greater than 30 years duration all around the country. And what you will see is there is no question that over the observed period of record, there has been a constant increase in the sea level, except for the areas of Alaska where we have different kinds of um, conditions, where we have rebound instead of, or, or tectonic activity instead of subsidence. So it's happening. Our snow melt, when we look at our snow-dominated watersheds in the west, we are looking at 30 years of observation supporting the changes. And these are statistically significant changes. So this is part of what we've been doing internally in the core is to look at the kind of changes that can't be argued with. We have data. We have tests of non-stationarity that show that significant changes have been made. And we are responding to these so that we can maintain the performance and reliability of those taxpayer investments in locks and dams and channels and, and everything else that we do. Okay. So let me, let me follow up. Really a question for all the panel is that um, we as engineers, you know, we, we get into the business because we were good at math. We like sciences and we love to solve problems where there was definition around the problems. And we are really good at that. You know, you give us a definition or you give us a standard. We got ASCE 7. We know what the codes say. We know what the snow loads are. We know what this is. We know what that is. Um, when it comes to this topic, and, and I'll stay on sea level rise for a second, um, we don't know what to design around, short of the city of D Virginia Beach telling us, well, this is what we're going to do with storms, or maybe this maps that you're referring to would do. So what's an engineer to do in Charleston, South Carolina, or Biloxi, Mississippi, or Southern California when there isn't a published standard for us to design around? We, we don't know the equation to solve around. Um, we know we have an issue, but we don't know specifically what to do. And so I would throw that to anybody on the panel because it comes up in question after question saying, okay, you're telling us we have this problem. What will we be designing around as engineers? We're not sure. My yeah, son, well. uh, what, I'll, what I will suggest is to pick up a copy of the Manual of Practice. <laughs> wait, yes. and there's, wait, there's no, 90, 98 signatures planned, left. Right? Two signatures have already gone. 98 <laughs> left, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And anyhow, we, ha we have a framework in the Manual of Practice, and I think it could be used until uh, in the interim, until we have standards. Right, and if, if I could add, so a lot of the questions, especially around sea level rise, are around flooding and flood inundation, and the steps that you would take to deal with flooding are entirely different than the steps you would take to deal with drought. Um, and the tool set that you would have to deal with either one of those is different for a community which has building codes and zoning and relocation at its disposal than a federal agency which doesn't have the ability to talk about those kinds of things. So I would say look to the kind of practices that are outlined in the book, and you don't have to buy it, just thumb through it and identify the areas. But I, but I did buy it, actually, because I'm interested in it. And uh, look for those kinds of standards. Look for different federal agencies. So if you're dealing with drought, go to the different water agencies. Look at California Division of Water Resources. Um, look at Canada has a very forward-looking uh, climate program. Look at the United Kingdom. They've got a super climate program both for sea level and for flooding. So look for these uh, engineers who are doing engineering work and, and doing planning and use the best available and then just justify it. You know, we took this thing from the United Kingdom uh, Thames barrier and here's why. It made sense and it was aligned with say, the Corps of Engineers and the ASCE manual and a, and a few others. So show how you're aligned with, uh, with existing policies or guidance that other people are using. Yeah. I have a little bit longer term solution, but uh, I think that uh, if uh, the ASCE uh, and others pushed all our civil engineering schools to have this as a requirement that it's in the curriculum, we would graduate a lot of young civil engineers who could answer that question for you, how you should plan for this. Uh, but until this is just routinely considered, uh, I think we will be working off of the fine work of Bilal. Uh, you'll be working off the fine work of Bilal and others. But we need to jumpstart this. It can't be so basic of what do I do, uh, because you're working on projects now that if they have a life cycle of 50 years, it will feel, it'll be hotter 
uh, pretty much wherever they are. As you know, as an owner, I, you know, and, and I've talked about the guidelines that, that the Port Authority put, to, put out, but as an owner, I want the engineers that do work for my agency to give me the best information they can to, uh, as was said here, to, um, to tell me that I need to change something or I need to improve something or I need to build something a little bit different. My guidelines might, might not be perfect. I want the engineers that work for us to, to say to me, this is how you can do this better. And I think that's what we, we as, a, as an industry have to continue to do. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, well speaking of doing it better, I'm gonna put you back on the hot seat, Jim. Um, what roles do construction materials play in resiliency? Mm -hmm. And what roles do civil engineers play in specifying these construction materials for increased re resiliency? And I'm assuming you learned lessons in Sandy and you're doing the George Washington Bridge. Those other projects, can you talk a little bit about the role of materials? Yeah, um, you know, cost comes into this also, of course, but you know, um, we've, we've looked at in some of our buildings not having or having more water resistant materials in the lower levels where we're, we're not elevating. Um, more uh, stone, concrete, those types of materials. Uh, we have a path station at Exchange Place in Jersey City, which is right along the Hudson, right across from Manhattan, Lower Manhattan. And that was flooded badly in Sandy. So we're replacing, we're putting a, a flood barrier at the doorways and replacing the glass, because it's a, a completely glass structure, with aquarium glass. So again, a very innovative solution by a designer who, uh, who proposed it to us. Um, so it, it's, it's looking at, again, materials that are practical, are easy or at least available for us to use, and make sense in being more resilient. And it's absolutely uh, the role of the engineer in the design process, especially early in the design process, to propose those types of materials that could help resiliency in a, in a vulnerable asset. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Well, I want to come back to you based on what Alice had just talked about. I was saying, hey, we got to get this in our academic, academic sector. So like, could you comment on maybe what University of Maryland does in their engineering program with respect to resiliency and sustainability and what you're doing to teach these next generation of engineers how to be more sustainable and more resilient? Um, I, I think, uh, Alice, this is an outstanding point. Uh, we do have in academia, we do uh, all, all the time, we track new trends, new hazards, and we'll adapt to them. Um, uh, we, we are still, we have constraints. Uh, we have to stay within so many credit hours. So always like a trade-off. What should I keep in and what should I remove? But always I think what we try to do is focus on the fundamentals. If somebody is well found, founded in the sciences, in the math, they should be able to tackle all our problems. Uh, also we focus on the economics. We cover that. We cover the uncertainty modeling, probability and statistics. We do offer classes now in resilience and sustainability. Um, so the, in, as, as an educator in academic institutions, we are tracking those you know, care, carefully and closely. Okay, good. Um, last question, um, and, and, and it relates to um, stormwater, um, and it was just talking about, you know, questioning, well, since we're seeing these increased storms, increased intensities, um, what are we doing about revising <laughs> the actual standards that we're actually doing, you know? So we see that Michael flies through and drops five inches on Virginia Beach, you know, so they, they came up with a thing, I, and Chris, maybe you can grab this one, is what are we doing to see that these standards for stormwater design, stormwater retention, and stormwater management are being revised to deal with what is viewed to be higher generation, longer term storms? Well, I know in the city of Virginia Beach, they did a year-long study that looked at um, the impact of rainfall uh, in conjunction with uh, sea level rise and land subsidence, and they, they knew the challenges that they faced in terms of we can either do something now or we can wait. And waiting was not an option. Um, and so they decided amongst themselves to go ahead and fund this study 
And the study led to the 20% the increase in rainfall amount. That's above and beyond what's currently um, in the design guidelines. And that's something that's proactive that I think a lot of municipalities can do. Um, unfortunately, um, everybody knows the federal government doesn't necessarily move at a pace that we would all like to see them move. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's incumbent upon us as engineers and it's incumbent upon the engineers that work for the public works facilities to, to take a look at this and take it seriously and figure out how are we going to adapt? Because you can really, you can either defend, you can retreat, or you can adapt. And which one of those are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. And we as a city, Virginia Beach, we decided that we were going to, uh, to adapt. Yeah, and so that's what we've done. Good. So we are near the end of our time, but I wanted to give you some feedback on our first experiment in the social media world. Um, we have 60 likes on Facebook already, 75 of which are international. So our international engineers are watching us from abroad um, and liking what we're doing. Um, we want to give these folks a round of applause for their thing. So please give them a round of applause. <laughs> and some brief housekeeping that you need to do is please complete your daily evaluation surveys that's found in the mobile app. Um, check your schedules and attend the next concurrent sessions that begin around 4.15. And stick around through lunch tomorrow to hear Christine Cash and give us an idea of how to have less stress and have more fun. So with that, we are adjourned from this meeting, and thanks for attending. Great.